My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time, I'm walking through two of the glorious Channel Islands and one of the darkest chapters in British history. Jersey and Guernsey have got dozens of beautiful beaches and almost all of them have got something like that on them. An old bunker or the remains of a machine gun post left over from the Second World War. But these weren't built by the British, they were put up by the Germans who invaded these islands in 1940. Seventy years ago, the tiny Channel Islands faced a grave threat to their traditional tranquility. Jersey and Guernsey are proudly British, but between 1940 and 1945, they were occupied by Nazi Germany. Today, in Guernsey's capital, St. Peterport, it's hard to imagine German soldiers marching through British streets. But that's exactly what happened. And I want to find out how this tiny corner of the British Isles survived five long years of Nazi rule. I've planned a four-day walk exploring Jersey and Guernsey's unique wartime heritage. I'm starting inland at Guernsey Airport, where the first German troops landed on British soil. From there, it's a bracing 10-mile walk along the stunning south coast, finishing in St. Peterport, where a ferry will take me the 30 miles to Jersey. On day two, I'm heading west to discover how the Germans turned Jersey's exposed coastline into an impregnable fortress. Inland, it's cross-country to visit war tunnels with a grim secret before returning to the north coast. And on my final day, I'll follow the road to victory, finishing in Jersey's capital, St. Helier, and the liberation of 1945. In May 1940, the Nazi war machine swept across Western Europe, pushing the British army back to the beaches of Dunkirk. From Belgium to the Channel Islands, British troops scrambled to escape to England. The Germans were now just 14 miles away from British soil. Today's walk in Guernsey is taking me through that chaotic summer. But before I start, I've got time for a quick look at St Peterport. In 1940, Guernsey's tiny capital was a town gripped by fear, as residents desperate to leave rubbed shoulders with refugees arriving from France. You can imagine, can't you, the local people watching the refugees get out of their boats and stagger up onto the docks, clutching the few possessions that they'd managed to save, and wondering if their homes would be the next in line. German high command was planning to invade, but the Nazis didn't realise that all British troops had retreated to England. So the Germans carried out an armed reconnaissance. On the 28th of June 1940, three Luftwaffe bombers flew low over the harbour and attacked. These docks were lined with trucks all the way down to the seafront, which from a few thousand feet up could have looked like troop carriers, but they weren't. In fact, they were stuffed full of these Guernsey tomatoes, ready and waiting to be loaded and exported to the UK. The raid killed dozens of innocent people and heralded five years of German rule. The actual invasion started here two days later. I've caught a lift to my walk start in a Morris 10, one of the few cars that survives from the war. 
70 years ago, this airport drop-off was a grassy runway, and it's where I'm meeting local historian Chris Oliver. On the 30th of June 1940, a platoon of German troops landed here, and to their relief, they met no opposition. The tiny British garrison had left, realising that defending the island would lead to a pointless bloodbath. Guernes is certainly small, just 24 square miles. Many of its quieter roads serve as footpaths too, where walkers have priority. Traffic is limited to just 15 miles an hour. Chris and I are heading out into the surrounding villages where the invading Germans wanted to make a good impression. What do the Germans think of the islanders? They wanted it to be a model occupation. There's no doubt about that. There were so many similarities in Berlin's mind between the English and the Germans. The records actually show that the German high command were thinking, hang on a second, this is part of Britain. We actually want to think in terms of the British people being akin to the Germanic race. In actual fact, some soldiers who got here thought they were landing in the Isle of Wight, and they were really trying to be as respectful as possible, and they were having lots of people who they were bringing in amongst the armed forces who spoke English to get on with the population. The German troops, for the first time, stepped foot on English soil. Those in the British Army of Occupation fled or were taken prisoner. The Third Reich's propaganda machine was delighted. This German newsreel painted a picture of British life supposedly carrying on as normal under German rule. The life of the island population proceeds orderly under the protection of German weapons. The local papers, though, revealed a few telling details. The clocks went forward to Berlin time and the pound was pegged to the Reichmark. When they arrived the following day, in the newspaper, front page, orders of the Commandant, and it said curfew, 11 o'clock till 6 o'clock. Gradually, islanders were not allowed to go out fishing, but they were allowed to do other things. They were allowed to sit in church and pray and offer prayers up and hymns up um, for the royal family. And why did they do that? Well, arguably, it's because, really, the Germans were on a high in 1940, thinking, we are Gangan in England, we're going to England, and we're going to win the war. The surrender of the Channel Islands was a humiliating blow to British prestige, and Churchill insisted that the Empire must strike back. The islands were once part of Normandy, and there's still a strong French feel about them. But the islanders are among the most loyal and long-standing subjects of the Crown. They've been fighting alongside the King of England since the days of William the Conqueror. This is Petty Bow Bay, which I think you'll agree is pretty flipping lovely. And behind me, this beach defence tower was built in order to repel invaders from the continent. Although at the time that was put up, it wasn't the Germans they were trying to chase off, it was the French. In July 1940, these popular little tourist coves became the island's secret back door. And I'm heading eight miles along the coast back to St. Peterport to find out how. The steep cliffs are tough going, but hugely rewarding. God, gets better and better. Churchill was determined to strike back after the Germans had landed. He decided that Guernsey would be the perfect place to try out a new elite unit of the British Army. He said that their job was to develop a reign of terror down the enemy coast. They were called the Commandos. London planned a daring raid. Special forces would seize the coastal path and head inland to attack the airport. But first, they sent in a young lieutenant called Hubert Nicoll to gather intelligence. He landed here at Ecar Point. To us nowadays, Lieutenant Nicoll's daring raid seems like boys' own stuff. But back in 1940, it was deadly serious. As he scrambled up the path from that beach down there with his heart in his mouth, he knew that if he was captured, he'd be shot as a spy. 
But Nicole had grown up in Guernsey. He knew this island like the back of his hand. And he discovered that only a handful of Germans had captured over 25,000 islanders. It seems incredible, but he managed to find out the exact number of Germans on the island. 469. Nicole had exposed just how weak the enemy was. 140 commandos now crossed the channel to capture and kill as many Germans as possible. It would be one of the first commando raids in history, but it ended in complete failure. One boat ended up on the island of Sark over there in the distance. Two capsized, one crashed into a rock. Only 40 men from number three commando finally made it here exhausted and soaked. And when they got here, they couldn't find a single German soldier. The commandos survived, but for Britain, the war was going from bad to worse. Germany was getting ready to invade England. Along the coast at Clarence Battery, machine gunners watched as German planes crossed the channel. Just a few weeks after the invasion of the Channel Islands, the Battle of Britain began in the skies of southern England over there. To many people living here under German rule, the result must have seemed like a foregone conclusion. That's certainly what the Germans told people as more and more troops appeared on the streets of St. Peterport in August 1940. Many islanders were frightened at the prospect of any contact with the enemy troops. Molly Behay grew up on Canisher Street during the war. What was your family's reaction like when the Germans finally did arrive? My mother was really terrified. She was frightened and she didn't want to meet any Germans. She was scared of what they looked like and what they would do and she just wouldn't leave the house. There was weeks that she didn't want to move. She didn't want to see any Germans. But then we children got used to them. We didn't like the look of them. They looked very, very stern. Always a helmet and guns and big boots. But so we I suppose we just got used to them and didn't really realise the fear that but the grown-ups... Yeah. But suddenly your whole life was changed. Definitely, definitely. 27,000 German troops were to descend on the islands, almost half in Jersey, which is my next destination. Thank you. Should be in Jersey in about an hour. 1940 had been a traumatic summer, but the focus of the war was about to shift because that September, the RAF won the Battle of Britain and the Germans were forced to put their invasion of England on hold. By the end of 1940, it was clear that the Channel Islands were the only bit of British soil that Hitler was going to be able to get his hands on, at least for the moment. The German war machine was ordered to transform these islands, even tiny little Herm and Sark over there, into island fortresses, with the islanders trapped behind a curtain of guns, bunkers and barbed wire. But how are they going to be able to do that? I'll be finding out tomorrow. I've arrived in Jersey to continue a walk through the Channel Islands wartime history. This morning, I'm treating myself to an al fresco breakfast at St. Obin's Bay. It's a lovely place to have my fried egg and bacon sandwich and think about the uh, rest of the day. 70 years ago, it would have looked very different around here. That cafe, for instance, wouldn't have been a cafe. It was a German bunker called Resistance Nest 3, and it didn't house a cappuccino machine, but a 10.5 centimetre gun. Today, I'm finding out how Hitler's fixation with the Channel Islands transformed their appearance. This leg of my journey will take me west from St. Oban's Bay to the heavily fortified headland at La Corbiere. I'll then turn north for five miles along St. Juan's Beach. 
before ending my day at a clifftop stronghold in Le Land. A 15 mile journey in glorious sunshine. In the summer of 1940, the German army had quite literally strolled into Jersey. British troops had abandoned these beaches without a fight. But when the RAF won the Battle of Britain, Hitler feared Churchill might try to reclaim these islands. Hitler was obsessed with holding on to the Channel Islands. The image of jackboots striding up and down British streets was a fantastic propaganda victory for him. So he decided to turn the whole place into an impregnable fortress. The islands became part of the Atlantic Wall, a network of fortified bunkers stretching from Norway to southern France. Building the wall took an estimated 17 million cubic metres of concrete, well over a million of which was used here in the Channel Islands. At the far end of the bay, the Germans modified an old railway line to carry ammunition and material. Today, the line of the old tracks is my route to the west coast, four miles of beautiful shaded walk through the island's interior. You can see how the Germans altered the island's infrastructure. Look, you've got this lovely old Jersey brickwork here, and then suddenly, wham, German concrete to support this bridge so that the big trucks can go past overhead. The railway walk is maintained as an arboretum. It's a refreshing change from the heat of the beach, and the canopy is filled with traditional oak trees, palms and sycamores. The railway line terminated here at Corbiere Headland, one of the island's best-known landmarks. Corbiere's lighthouse was built in 1874, and was the first in the British Isles to be made of reinforced concrete. But the Germans now built new concrete structures right next to it. Look at this bunker. Those walls are around about two metres thick. You can see why the Germans would have wanted to put up such impressive fortifications here. From up here, you can see almost the entire coast. It's pretty lovely, isn't it? And you see that tower, it's called an MP2. It's where rangefinders used to be able to direct fire onto enemy ships. Well, that's what they used to do in the war. Now it's a holiday home. These bunkers are now part of the tourist trail, but historian Paul Sanders says their construction left the islanders with a terrible dilemma. The Germans demanded men to help build them, but the local island authorities refused. How could they do that? Under the Hague Convention, or an occupier is not allowed to force people to work against their own country. So the Jersey authorities made it very clear to the Germans that, they, that for certain types of work, they wouldn't uh, oblige. They said that we can get people for you who will work on building airports or building bridges or infrastructure, work that's not immediately war-related but we're not going to help you building your gun emplacements. And it's a, a nice moral stand to make, but I would have thought that the army could go over the bridges and go past the gun emplacements. Somewhere. That's the dilemma again. Here we go, catch-22. Yeah. 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 But it's still a fairly elegant way out of, out of this dilemma. The civilian authorities walked a dangerous tightrope between protecting their own people and helping the enemy. They're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, very much so. There's always the slippery slope waiting for you. Yeah, you, can, you can accede to German demands on some issue, and then you know, they, they take your hand and they want the whole army at the end of it. The Germans held most of the cards, but they did have something to lose. They wanted to build a, an empire that was somehow similar to the British Empire. They so always... by getting hold of the Channel Islands, it was like they got a little slice of Britain. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So if they dealt they well... Them a kick yeah, yeah, yeah. Having... So if they dealt, dealt well with the Channel Islanders, it would... Hey, guys, this is what will happen if we take over Britain. We'll be fair Yeah, with exactly. You. Yeah, it was a charm offensive here. I'm now turning north, heading up St Juan's Bay, which stretches for five miles. As the tide goes out, Jersey grows in size by about a fifth, 
making beaches like this the perfect place to land an enemy army. This is a panzer mound, German word, of course. Panzer is the German word for tank. It's up to 20 foot high, curved at the top. The foundations are covered in about six feet of sand. And the reason that the Germans were prepared to invest so much in the defences here was because it was this open west coast where they thought the British would attack. But the Allies never had any intention of taking Jersey back by force. St. Juan's anti-tank barrier was nothing but a huge drain on German resources. And it wasn't the only one. I'm leaving St. Juan's beach and continuing north to Leyland, Jersey's largest maritime heathland, and home of another serious fortification. Granite cliffs dominate this part of the island, and gazing out across the Atlantic Ocean is one of the most complete World War II gun batteries in existence. This is Battery Moltke, which is maintained by volunteers from the Channel Islands Occupation Society. Hello, Tony. Hello, Tony. <laughs> this is a beautiful gun, isn't it? Absolutely superb, yeah. Does it have a name? Yes, it's a 15.5 centimetre K418F French field gun. It was quite a, a serious piece of defence, wasn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely, yes. Battery Moltke was the first heavy battery to actually come to Jersey in March 1941. This fearsome gun had a range of 12 miles. It was one of four captured from the French and garrisoned by a hundred German soldiers. Where did they live? Where did they cook their tea? Well, they had uh, the exterior barrack huts um, for everyday things like that. But when they're actually on action stations, they had the uh, subterranean corridors and personnel shelter to hide in. Once underground, you realise how massive this battery is. Well, I wasn't expecting that. Well, it's quite something, isn't it? The tunnels have been restored, along with signs and symbols you don't expect to see on British soil. Hitler had even grander plans for this place, but the bigger guns never arrived. The men inside trained and waited for an invasion that never came. It must have been very boring being stuck here. I, th I, th I think they must have thought of home quite a lot, actually. Did any of them try and get away? Well, there was a few that actually tried to sign up for Russian Front. There were some that really wanted to see action. They'd rather be on the Russian Front well, than some here. Were, some were really wanting to go, but uh, I'm sure that they, some of the older ones realised that they're better off here. Absolutely. <laughs> It's rather comforting that Hitler's prestige project turned out to be a white elephant. The gun platforms are now surrounded by heather, one of more than 200 plant species here. It's in full bloom during July and August, and it glows with colour in the evening light as I reach the northwestern tip of the island. It's a pretty good viewpoint, this, isn't it? The sark. Herm, little Breku, Guernsey, over there and somewhere over the horizon, Alderney. Tomorrow, I want to swap sides and find out what life was like for the islanders who lived in the shadow of these concrete fortresses. But it's getting late and I've still got another couple of miles to go, if I don't want to spend the night in a German bunker. I'm in Jersey on a hike through the island's wartime heritage and it's time to find out what life was like for local people during the Nazi regime. As well as the struggles of everyday life, German rule threw up new kinds of moral dilemmas. How far should you cooperate with the Germans? Should you even speak to a German soldier? Could you or should you resist the occupation? These weren't philosophical questions. They were matters of life and death. Especially when the islanders were confronted with one of the darkest aspects of the occupation. One which exposed the brutality of Nazi rule. I'm setting off from St. Juan, heading south for six miles towards the Jersey war tunnels, where I'll hear stories of courage and betrayal. 
The footpaths disappear halfway across the island, so I'll catch a lift, continuing my walk back on the north coast. A pleasant 12-mile hike, but with some dark reminders of our recent past. Heading south, I've come to the Val de la Mar Reservoir. From here, there are stunning views over the west coast. But if I'd been stood here 70 years ago, I'd have been looking down on slave labourers from Eastern Europe, being forced to build bunkers in the military railway. In 1941, the German army had launched an invasion of the Soviet Union. Their advance eastward resulted in millions of prisoners, many of whom were put to work all over Europe. So was this part of the defensive wall? Dr Jilly Carr has spent years piecing together their story. Jilly, it's hard to believe, isn't it, when you look out on that view that so much human suffering could have taken place there? Yeah, it's true. I think one of the stories that isn't told enough here is the story of the slave workers and force workers. I mean, the Germans brought about 16,000 workers to the Channel Islands. What's the difference between a forced worker and a slave worker? You get paid if you're a force worker and you don't get paid if you're a slave worker. The force workers are people who came from Western Europe, but also the Spanish Republicans as well, the people who were fleeing Franco in Spain. Germans had the Spanish Republicans, used them to help build the Atlantic Wall in France and then brought them over to the Channel Islands. The slaves were mostly Russian and Ukrainian prisoners of war. Over three million Soviet POWs died at the hands of the Germans during the war, but 3,000 were brought to Jersey. These are the sort of people that the Germans are treating really badly, giving very little food. They're kicked, they're beaten. When you read accounts in people's diaries, it was shocking, and some Channel Islanders tried to intervene to stop these people being beaten and kicked and generally treated like dirt. What conditions did people live in when they were working here? We know there are labour camps across the Channel Islands. There were 12 labour camps in Jersey alone. So I guess we should picture wooden barrack huts. Lager Immelmann would have been down there. It was, uh, it was a Russian slave worker camp. And if we were living during the war, we would have been able to see that from here. This aerial photograph, taken in 1943, is thought to show where Lager Immelmann once stood, a circle of six huts surrounded by barbed wire. Some of the Soviet prisoners living in the camp were marched to work many miles away. And I'm heading east to see what they built. This entrance was carved out of the rock by slave workers. And there's not just one tunnel down there. These are the Jersey War Tunnels. They were intended to be an underground invasion shelter. But there's nothing comforting about what went on here. I find this really disturbing. It's an unfinished tunnel and it gives you a very vivid sense of the dreadful conditions in which the slave labourers worked. You can't go any further even today because of the risk of falling rocks. We'll never know exactly how many prisoners died from exhaustion, starvation and beatings. But some are still buried here. Many islanders were so appalled by the treatment of the Russian workers, they risked their lives to help them. Louisa Gould ran a local shop in St Juan, and in 1942 she offered refuge to a prisoner who had escaped from nearby Lager Immelmann. He was Fyodor Polikarpovich Buric, a Russian pilot shot down in 1941. Bob Lassur, who's 93, remembers them both well. What kind of woman was Louise Gould? She was a splendid individual, and she had only just recently received a Red Cross message to say that her elder son had been lost at sea. And her words to me were, 
I had to do something for another mother's son. Fyodor became known as Russian Bill, and he stayed hidden at Louisa's house for 18 months. But in 1942, Louisa was betrayed. Russian Bill managed to escape, but she was arrested and sentenced to two years in a German prison. And this is where you come in. I came in because I already knew him. I put him in the filing room of my office, and it must have been either Easter or Whitson. It was a long weekend, and so I had an extra day to find somewhere, which was first a lock-up garage, then a garden shed, then the flat of a crusty old bachelor, then the quite luxurious home of the crusty old bachelor's girlfriend. And he survived in Jersey till he the end of the war? He survived in Jersey with two young men sharing a flat until the liberation. Why did you do it? Why do you think Louisa did it? I think, in most cases, it was common humanity. I think that was why I was doing it. War tunnels have been turned into a museum and it reveals how the occupation brought out the best and the worst of people. One of the most chilling exhibits for me in this entire museum is this little collection of three letters, all written to the Germans by Jersey citizens in which they denounce their neighbours. Uh, look at this one, it's written to, if I can find the envelope, yes, yeah, that one the Commandant, and it says, please search Brampton Villa, St Union Road, for at least two wirelesses hidden underneath floorboards, loft and cellars. It is a lodging house. And it's all in capitals, so that no one will be able to identify who wrote it. And OK, this stuff is horrible, it is disgusting, but in a strange kind of way there's an upside, isn't there? Because it shows that there was resistance going on, there were acts of defiance, there was some kind of secret heroism. But bravery came with a high price. 250 people who broke the German rules were sent to prison on the continent. 29 of them never returned. Louisa Gould died in Ravensbrück concentration camp just a few months before the end of the war. From the war tunnels, I'm picking up the trail towards the north coast, where there should be a view right across to France. It's a pleasant walk along more of those walkers' roads. They take me past the Museum of Country Life in Hampton. In 1941, Islanders fought a daily battle against hunger. The basic rations would later provide everyone with just a thousand calories a day. Everyday items became luxuries. I've arranged to meet Islander Marion Rossler for a coffee, except this is a cup of wartime coffee, brewed by chef Sean Rankin, but made with parsnips. It Dry does smell a bit it like does. coffee. It does, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, grated some parsnips, um, dried them out, cooked them in the oven for around about 20 minutes, mm. and I was going to put them in a pestle and mortar, grind them up, and then see if we can try some coffee. For islanders like Marion, substitute food became the norm. <gasps> Look what you're going to have to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow. You're welcome. Right, let's have a taste. It's not that much like coffee, but it's, it's, it, it's like those old chicory coffees that you used to have. What was it like for you as a child, having to eat all this wartime food? I didn't know any different. I suppose you didn't. That's no, that what you would have always remembered. Do you ever remember being hungry as a little girl? Yes, I do. I do remember being hungry. We were very lucky in that we lived near the sea, which was good for, for, fish. for fish. Bread was something very special, and I can remember my brother and I found a loaf that was the week supply for four of us and we ate the lot. My poor mother, what could she do for the rest of the week? But that's the way it was. It's probably down to their diet 
that by the end of the war, Channel Island children were on average one inch shorter than they should have been. From Hampton, it's mostly roads until I reach the north coast. So I'm getting a lift on what's known round here as a Jersey van. In the early days of the German occupation, many islanders had their vehicles requisitioned. But by 1944, fuel shortages meant that even the Germans had to get around by horse. By this point, though, Germany was losing the war on all fronts. The Allies were on the offensive in Russia and the Mediterranean, and their next target was Jersey's closest neighbour. There's Normandy on the horizon, just 19 miles away. And in June 1944, the Allied invasion over there gave the islanders hope that they too would soon be free. Liberation did come for them, of course, but not until May the following year. And tomorrow, I want to try and find out why it took so long. Some of the 11,000 planes that opened the path through the so-called impregnable Atlantic Wall. On the 6th of June, 1944, more than 100,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. This was D-Day. The liberation of occupied France had begun just 15 miles from Jersey. Here in the German-occupied Channel Islands, people didn't need to hear about D-Day on their hidden wireless sets. They could see and hear it for themselves. The final morning of my wartime walk has brought me to St Catherine's Bay on the east coast. To see how the occupation came to an end, I'm heading along the sprawling sandy beach of Grooville Bay and across into St Helier, where liberation finally arrived in May 1945. The fighting in France put the Germans in Jersey on high alert, and their commander, a proud professional soldier, ordered his men to dig in at places like Victoria Tower, where I'm meeting historian Ian Ronane. They placed a, an anti-aircraft gun on top of it. There's famous pictures you'll see of a German and a gun pointing up. The Germans realised to their horror that despite their mighty Atlantic wall, their defences on this side of the island were inadequate. It must have been an incredible psychological shift, both for the Germans and for Jersey people, once all that land was back in Allied hands. I think for the islanders, it was a time of real mixed emotions. You know, firstly, they could see the fighting going on and hear the fighting going on, and therefore there was an elation about, we may be liberated soon, but progressively they realised that actually the Germans were going to remain here and they were isolated and cut off. Why didn't Churchill try and take the Channel Islands back after D-Day? I think Churchill, quite frankly, would have taken them back at any time if he could have done, but level aheads were saying, look, you know, this, this would be such a, a catastrophic loss of life potentially. So they made that decision to isolate the Germans here. Uh, and let them starve. And, you know, Churchill said it, let them wither on the vine. The downside of doing that, of course, is the locals starve alongside them. In August, all supplies stopped. In nearby Montalgai Castle, hungry Germans watched as the Allies cut off their lifeline to France. Churchill tried to persuade the occupiers to surrender. But in reply, the Germans asked the Allies to send the islanders food aid to make their own rations go further. Everyone on the island was competing for the same dwindling supplies and all faced starvation in the coming winter. I'm pressing ahead along the Royal Bay of Grooville, which in 1944 was heavily mined so couldn't be fished. Hungry islanders couldn't even exploit traditional sources of food. Those black things, they look like invasion craft, don't they? But they're not. They're for farming oysters. You'd get a lot of oysters out of one of them, wouldn't you? Lovely. Walkers have to be a bit careful here, 
The tide can come racing back in at more than six miles an hour. That's probably faster than most people can run. But after D-Day, several young islanders were willing to risk not just the strong currents, but also the German patrols in order to escape to France. I'm calling in on John Floyd and his wife, Corette. In November 1944, John took part in a daring attempt to sail away and join the British forces in Normandy. How old were you when you escaped? I was 20, just 21. And you two were courting? Yes. <laughs> Why did you decide to escape? Was it patriotism, adventure? Well, it's, it's a bit old-fashioned now, isn't it? But I it, don't know. It was. I was brought up that way. Yeah. We were sort of left behind, and our sort of brothers and elders had all fighting the war, which we heard about, of course. So naturally, we felt out of it and um, wanted to join them. How did you feel about him escaping? Oh, not very pleasant. Not in, didn't enjoy the fact that he was going. So many things went wrong, you couldn't believe it was actually going to work. Corette helped John and two friends smuggle a dinghy onto the beach right under the noses of the German guards. The plan was for the three young men to slip away in the dead of night. A few weeks earlier, someone else had attempted the same thing and been shot dead by the Germans. But that didn't dissuade determined young islanders. But we got about a mile or two out and we met the people who were leaving at the same time in a different boat and they couldn't start their motor. And we stopped to give them a tow and the water came over the back of the boat and, and wet the outboard motor and that was finished, then it wouldn't go. After trying and failing to restart his engine, John did eventually drift to France. He found the British Army. But Corette didn't know if he was alive or dead. How long was it before you knew he was safe? Not till the following May, when the war ended. Really? Yes. And when were you reunited? End of July, beginning of August, mm. I think. And you've been together ever since? <laughs> yeah, more or less. SKPs like John confirmed to the British authorities just how desperate conditions were for the 40,000 islanders. But help was on its way. The Allies had finally agreed to let the Red Cross in. After a 50-mile journey, I've arrived in St Helier, where on New Year's Eve 1944, the SS Vega docked, carrying 120,000 food parcels. Liberation still took another four months, but the food kept the islanders alive through the winter, and people took heart as the Allies advanced into Germany. V for victory. That started springing up all over the place. By early May 1945, Hitler was dead and the war was over. Into the harbour of St. Peter Port on Guernsey in the Channel Islands steams a British warship with the white ensign flying. On the 9th of May, two British destroyers, HMS's Bulldog and Beagle, sailed into the Channel Islands and took the surrender of the German garrison. Jubilant crowds gathered in what's now Liberation Square. 200 British troops marched into St Helier and received, as you can see, a rapturous welcome. The memorial at the centre of the square is dedicated to all those who made that day possible. It's now a tourist attraction, and where I'm meeting Bob, Marion, and their fellow islander, Leo Harris. I know the Day of Liberation was incredibly important to everyone who was living in Jersey, but Marion, you were such a little girl. Do you actually remember it? I do. All I can remember was my parents being very, very excited and saying that our boys were coming. Now, I didn't know who our boys were, but I knew that friendly aeroplanes were overhead, so it must be something special. And you got some photos? I uh have. -huh. My mother had a brownie camera, and we saw our boys coming in, and these are treasured possessions. They really are. Leah, was it very different for you? 
most different thing, I suppose, was the fact that my brother had just come out of prison after six months. He was taking a German army rifle, so they'd locked him up without any trial. And uh, after we'd got over the joy of saying hello to him, we came down here. And here were these homely British soldiers speaking in Hampshire accents, just here actually, at this very spot we're sitting in now. Did you get a sense that things had changed very much? Two Spitfires shot over the bay, came around, zoomed over a second time, and I burst into tears. But I mean burst into tears with sobbing. Now, in those days, it was highly bad form to show any emotion of any kind in public. And I couldn't control it. But I happened to see a man of about 40 standing nearby who was also in tears and I didn't feel quite so badly. It's been very moving to hear so many personal accounts of these wartime events. I'm ending my walk at Elizabeth Castle in St Helier, where many Germans found themselves staying on as prisoners of war. From here, the invaders could look back on the island they'd ruled for five years and wonder what it had all been for. Since the war, the islanders have rebuilt their lives, but they've preserved an assortment of bunkers and batteries as a reminder of their darkest hour. And now, it's beyond doubt that the occupation is part of the tourist trail. But after 70 years, it's beginning to move from living memory into history. And I think it's reassuring that it's starting to become part of the island's future, ensuring that what went on here in the war years will never be forgotten. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you can download a guide to my walk by going to www.channel4.com. The life-changing injuries and the attitudes to disability. Arthur Williams presents World War I, Forgotten Heroes. It's available to catch up with on 4OD. Next tonight, colour TV and teletext all came in this decade. But what were attitudes like? It was all right in the 70s. My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time, I'm walking through two of the glorious Channel Islands and one of the darkest chapters in British history. Jersey and Guernsey have got dozens of beautiful beaches and almost all of them have got something like that on them, an old bunker or the remains of a machine gun post left over from the Second World War. But these weren't built by the British, they were put up by the Germans, who invaded these islands in 1940. Seventy years ago, the tiny Channel Islands faced a grave threat to their traditional tranquility. Jersey and Guernsey are proudly British, but between 1940 and 1945, they were occupied by Nazi Germany. Today in Guernsey's capital, St. Peterport, it's hard to imagine German soldiers marching through British streets. But that's exactly what happened. And I want to find out how this tiny corner of the British Isles survived five long years of Nazi rule. I've planned a four-day walk exploring Jersey and Guernsey's unique wartime heritage. I'm starting inland at Guernsey Airport, where the first German troops landed on British soil. From there, it's a bracing 10-mile walk along the stunning south coast 
finishing in St. Peterport, where a ferry will take me the 30 miles to Jersey. On day two, I'm heading west to discover how the Germans turned Jersey's exposed coastline into an impregnable fortress. Inland, it's cross-country to visit war tunnels with a grim secret before returning to the north coast. And on my final day, I'll follow the road to victory, finishing in Jersey's capital, St. Helier, and the liberation of 1945. This became the island's secret back door. And I'm heading eight miles along the coast back to St. Peterport to find out how. The steep cliffs are tough going, but hugely rewarding. God, it gets better and better. Churchill was determined to strike back after the Germans had landed. He decided that Guernsey would be the perfect place to try out a new elite unit of the British Army. He said that their job was to develop a reign of terror down the enemy coast. They were called the Commandos. London planned a daring raid. Special forces would seize the coastal path and head inland to attack the airport. But first, they sent in a young lieutenant called Hubert Nicoll to gather intelligence. He landed here at Ecar Point. To us nowadays, Lieutenant Nicoll's daring raid seems like boys' own stuff. But back in 1940, it was deadly serious as he scrambled up the path from that beach down there with his heart in his mouth, he knew that if he was captured, he'd be shot as a spy. But Nicole had grown up in Guernsey. He knew this island like the back of his hand, and he discovered that only a handful of Germans had captured over 25,000 islanders. It seems incredible, but he managed to find out the exact number of Germans on the island, 469. Nicole had exposed just how weak the enemy was. 140 commandos now crossed the channel to capture and kill as many Germans as possible. It would be one of the first commando raids in history, but it ended in complete failure. One boat ended up on the island of Sark over there in the distance. Two capsized, one crashed into a rock. Only 40 men from number three commando finally made it here exhausted and soaked. And when they got here, they couldn't find a single German soldier. The commandos survived, but for Britain, the war was going from bad to worse. Germany was getting ready to invade England. Along the coast at Clarence Battery, machine gunners watched as German planes crossed the channel. Just a few weeks after the invasion of the Channel Islands, the Battle of Britain began in the skies of southern England over there. To many people living here under German rule, the result must have seemed like a foregone conclusion. That's certainly what the Germans told people as more and more troops appeared on the streets of St. Peterport in August 1940. Many islanders were frightened at the prospect of any contact with the enemy troops. Molly Behay grew up on Canisha Street during the war. What was your family's reaction like when the Germans finally did arrive? My mother was really terrified. She was frightened and she didn't want to meet any Germans. She was scared of what they looked like and what they would do and she just wouldn't leave the house. There was weeks that she didn't want to move. She didn't want to see any Germans. But then we children got used to them. We didn't like the look of them. They looked very, very stern. Always a helmet and guns and big boots. But so we I suppose we just got used to them and didn't really realise the fear that but the grown-ups had. But suddenly your whole life was changed. Definitely, definitely. 27,000 German troops were to descend on the islands. 
almost half in Jersey, which is my next destination. Thank you. Should be in Jersey in about an hour. 1940 had been a traumatic summer, but the focus of the war was about to shift, because that September, the RAF won the Battle of Britain, and the Germans were forced to put their invasion of England on hold. By the end of 1940, it was clear that the Channel Islands were the only bit of British soil that Hitler was going to be able to get his hands on, at least for the moment. The German war machine was ordered to transform these islands, even tiny little Herm and Sark over there, into island fortresses, with the islanders trapped behind a curtain of guns, bunkers and barbed wire. But how are they going to be able to do that? I'll be finding out tomorrow. I've arrived in Jersey to continue a walk through the Channel Islands wartime history. This morning, I'm treating myself to an al fresco breakfast. Chris and I are heading out into the surrounding villages where the invading Germans wanted to make a good impression. What do the Germans think of the islanders? They wanted it to be a model occupation. There's no doubt about that. There were so many similarities in Berlin's mind between the English and the Germans. The records actually show that the German high command were thinking, hang on a second, this is part of Britain. We actually want to think in terms of the British people being akin to the Germanic race. In actual fact, some soldiers who got here thought they were landing in the Isle of Wight and they were really trying to be as respectful as possible and they were having lots of people who they were bringing in amongst the armed forces who spoke English to get on with the population. The German troops, for the first time, stepped foot on English soil. Those in the British Army of Occupation fled or were taken prisoner. The Third Reich's propaganda machine was delighted. This German newsreel painted a picture of British life supposedly carrying on as normal under German rule. The life of the island population proceeds orderly under the protection of German weapons. The local papers, though, revealed a few telling details. The clocks went forward to Berlin time, and the pound was pegged to the Reichmark. When they arrived the following day, in the newspaper, front page, orders of the Commandant, and it said curfew, 11 o'clock till 6 o'clock. Gradually, islanders were not allowed to go out fishing, but they were allowed to do other things. They were allowed to sit in church and pray and offer prayers up and hymns up um, for the royal family. And why did they do that? Well, arguably, it's because, really, the Germans were on a high in 1940, thinking, we are Gangen in England, we're going to England, and we're going to win the war. The surrender of the Channel Islands was a humiliating blow to British prestige, and Churchill insisted that the Empire must strike back. The islands were once part of Normandy, and there's still a strong French feel about them. But the islanders are among the most loyal and long-standing subjects of the crown. They've been fighting alongside the King of England since the days of William the Conqueror. This is Petty Bow Bay, which I think you'll agree is pretty flipping lovely. And behind me, this beach defence tower was built in order to repel invaders from the continent. Although at the time that was put up, it wasn't the Germans they were trying to chase off, it was the French. In July 1940, these popular little tourist codes... In May 1940, the Nazi war machine swept across Western Europe, pushing the British army back to the beaches of Dunkirk. From Belgium to the Channel Islands, British troops scrambled to escape to England. The Germans were now just 14 miles away from British soil. Today's walk in Guernsey is taking me through that chaotic summer. But before I start, I've got time for a quick look at St Peterport. In 1940, Guernsey's tiny capital was a town gripped by fear as residents desperate to leave rubbed shoulders with refugees arriving from France. 
You can imagine, can't you, local people watching the refugees get out of their boats and stagger up onto the docks, clutching the few possessions that they'd managed to save and wondering if their homes would be the next in line. German High Command was planning to invade, but the Nazis didn't realise that all British troops had retreated to England. So the Germans carried out an armed reconnaissance. On the 28th of June 1940, three Luftwaffe bombers flew low over the harbour and attacked. These docks were lined with trucks all the way down to the seafront, which from a few thousand feet up could have looked like troop carriers, but they weren't. In fact, they were stuffed full of these Guernsey tomatoes, ready and waiting to be loaded and exported to the UK. The raid killed dozens of innocent people and heralded five years of German rule. The actual invasion started here two days later. I've caught a lift to my walk start in a Morris 10, one of the few cars that survives from the war. 70 years ago, this airport drop-off was a grassy runway, and it's where I'm meeting local historian Chris Oliver. On the 30th of June 1940, a platoon of German troops landed here, and to their relief, they met no opposition. The tiny British garrison had left, realising that defending the island would lead to a pointless bloodbath. Guernsey is certainly small, just 24 square miles. Many of its quieter roads serve as footpaths too, where walkers have priority. Traffic is limited to just 15 miles an hour.